quickly because I think we've got quite a few people um, who are interested in talks we have tonight. We've got four different speakers. Um, I'll be talking about the basics of text, uh, RNNs and embeddings. Um, so it's kind of a more general but introductory thing. Essentially, you need to know the basics before we can start to discuss the more exciting stuff. Um, we have Karthik, who's going to talk about um, sentiment analysis. So something, if you've got a website and you want to uh, understand the complaints, then that's what he'll be talking about. We've got Anusha, who's then talking. She's talking about summarization, which is an important thing if you want to you deluge with data. And finally, Sam will talk. Um, he's got like a five-minute presentation. He's a lightning talk this time, partly to kind of show you what he might talk about as the main event next time. So that we figure that the next um, big meetup we have will be like an advanced text thing. Um, but we want to kind of poll to see what people would like to see. So uh, we've also got, as I said before, we've got some swag. There could be a giveaway. I'll put up a bit.ly link at the end of my presentation. Um, but now, let me go for it. When we're ready, we're still coming in, still coming in, okay. So, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, recurrent neural networks and text. And this is our fourth meetup. So if you haven't been to the other three, this is going to, the, the introduction to this is going to be rather abrupt. So this is a bit about me. Here we go. So I, I have a background. I did a PhD ages and ages ago in machine intelligence. I was in New York doing finance, kind of startup-y thing. I moved from New York to Singapore in September 2013. For 2014, the whole year, I basically had fun. And I was doing open source, reading papers, writing code, playing with drones. That was a good time. Since 2015, is, I've been in serious mode, um, doing natural language processing and deep learning at a local company. And I'm on particularly good behavior and particularly serious tonight because we have four representatives at the front here from the company. Um, now, I say it's serious, but we actually have, I have quite a lot of fun, but anyway. So I've also been doing kind of workshops and writing papers and uh, generally a uh, deep learning enthusiast. So in outline for, for my piece, I'm going to talk a little bit about basic neural networks rather abruptly move on to recurrent neural networks, both the basic idea and what problems immediately arise, and then GRUs and LSTMs, which are your, well, essentially the, the basic building blocks that people use. Then I'll talk a little bit about natural language processing, which is a, a more tricky subject than just picture processing in some sense. Tokenization, also word embeddings. And then I've got a little application demo which talks about uppercase named entity recognition, which we'll get to and you'll understand by the time I get there. So, quick review. Um, a basic neuron does simple computation. Layers of no neurons can do feature creation. And if you haven't already... Sorry, th this... If you go to Red Cat Lab's presentations... No, if you go to Red Cat Lab's slash P, you can actually see this presentation on your own laptop. Um, you can also look at the previous sl slides which we had from previous talks. They're all online. Um, basically, when I say simple, this is a single neuron. What we have here is some inputs. So this may be, this, for instance, these X's could be the humidity, the precipitation, the sunshine, the temperature. Da, da, da. The output is, is it winter? So this is a very simple idea. Basically, in order to map these inputs to this output, what I'll do is I'll sum up these inputs times some weights, and then I'll apply a nonlinearity. And this is the result of one thing. Now, if you think about it, by multiplying these weights by the inputs, I'm generating a kind of a linear feature. Um, this nonlinearity actually means I'll have linear on one side and then zero everywhere else. So this is a, a very simple function. You can't learn much with this function. But if you change the weights, then it will do different stuff. You can then combine these in multiple layers. So the question is, how would you train all of the weights? If you did a linear regression, 
you could easily train this first one, but by the time you've put them in layers, it's very difficult to see how errors up here will translate to errors down, or, or changes in weights down here. So if you want to understand how this all works, there's a thing called the TensorFlow Playground, which is great fun to have a play with, which is at playground.tensorflow.org. Um, basically, this allows you to set some Xs or some features on this side and look and try and classify some points into blue and orange on this side. And you can add different numbers of neurons within a layer or different numbers of layers here. And so this is great fun to play with. If you press the play button, it will then train and you can see it converge or not. Um, very nice little example. But the basic thing, the basic takeaway, so this is where I kind of finish with neural networks, is once you do, for doing supervised learning, you have inputs and outputs where you know the data. We've seen what a single neuron can learn, but the goal is we need to train a whole network to, to predict the outputs from the inputs. And what we do is essentially play a blame game. In, if we're making errors at the output, basically we can assign how much blame for the inputs for the layer before, how much should we jiggle each of these little weights to, to fix up what it told us. But equally, that will then give us uh, an error at the previous layer. It can then assign blame. It can then assign blame backwards. By assigning blame all the way through the networks, essentially iteratively, you can then blame every single weight for the error that you got. So if your, outputs of the pic your inputs of the picture said this was a cat and it was a dog, Basically, you can say, well, what caused me to say that? And every single layer through this network, you can fix up a little bit. But of course, that fixing up a little bit will then change every, every other answer you've ever given. So you have to iterate this. And this is where you need a GPU, uh, basically, to make this thing finish. The other thing, the other takeaway here is that these deep networks create features on these intermediate layers. So that even if you don't understand the structure of the problem yourself, it has often been observed that this will create features which are useful for solving the problem. Um, the mathematics of this are not well understood. So if you, want to, if you want to show your boss, here's a model which will always work for these reasons, this is not the right room to be in. If you, if you want a model, if no other model works, then this is the right place to be because these things often work in practice, though in theory, no one really knows. Okay, that was simple neural net. That was deep neural networks. Now on to uh, images. One of the nice things about an image is you've got some organisation amongst the inputs. So each input here would be the top left pixel, then the one next to it, then the one next to that. But this, these are very much more related to each other than the temperature and the precipitation and you know, random other variables. Images have coherence amongst them. So you know that there's this whole concept of up and down, left and right. You've also got maybe rotation you could do. There are various other transformations which self-consistently, or expansion, self-consistent within the image. And wouldn't it be nice to, to use an, an operator which understood that? So the idea here is we're going to use a whole image as a feature instead of just a single number. And the way which we... Um, use that is basically we say, well, Photoshop knows about features. Photoshop filters enable me to manipulate an entire image at once in the same way. I can apply a blur, I can apply a sharpen, and I can, I can apply an edge detector, something like that. So very simple filters, um, but these will only be um, controlled by very few parameters. So you'd have a, a very simple, what's called a kernel, which you'd apply across the picture, in order to produce the next feature, essentially, you can just vary these nine numbers and you'll get a whole new picture out. You can produce multiple different pictures, multiple different views, and you pile these all together um, and you'll have, overall, a convolutional neural network. These work super well, and if you wanted to know exactly how well they worked, you should have been here in the last three uh, meetups. I'm sure we'll get back to images, but today is text. So, the one thing which we haven't addressed is sequences. So in, in the previous examples, we've had a, you know, a set of features that we knew, or we've had an image of a certain size, but very, a lot of real-world data occurs in a sequence. So, so whereas you know, often have fixed inputs, 
lots of domains have um, sequences of stuff. For instance, text, you can think of a series of words, or English text is definitely a series of words. Um, or you can think of text as just a whole string of characters, including space. Or you could think of text as being uh, you know, a question and a response and a, an email and a whole dialogue as being a sequence of different events that happen. Equally, you can think of the audio, which I'm spewing at you, as being a whole sequence of CD quality, 16-bit um, values, right? And how, how would you deal with that? Equally, video clips. So what you see from me is also a huge sequence of, of new events. So th the question is, what kind of technique can we do that you can apply to these again and again? And essentially, by kind of like a symmetry argument, you want to do the same thing again and again. And really, it should have the same parameters again and again. So for processing sequences, basically the variable length input doesn't fit the models we've had before. What you want to do is run a network on the inputs at a given time step, and then that's, that network will be used at the next time step, and the next time step, and the next time step. But it's all very well processing these as independent events, but the whole point of a sequence is that they're linked together. So what, what you do is you pass along a hidden state from one network to the next one. So the, this one will have an output which will then feed into the hidden state of this one, which will then feed onto the next one, feed onto the next one, feed onto the next one. But the trick is, though, that this is all the same network, just used repeatedly. And even though you know, we, we don't know what the hidden state should represent, this thing will learn to have a nice hidden state or a nice internal representation because you incent it to do so because of this whole blame game thing. So as you, if what you can think of it is like in a time sequence, but if I've got an answer at the end which I'm trying to get to, I want to assign blame. That blame will then propagate backwards through time. It's as if I had a very deep network back to, if I want to blame the very first word in the sentence, as, a, as an input, I will have a very deep network to deal with. So, in a sense, time is depth. Um, hopefully we can learn some features internally which are useful, and it turns out that this often happens. So, I've, this thing is kind of the key point, so I'll say it again and again. Um, recurrent neural networks. So basically we have one network at every step of the input. It has kind of an internal state that can be carried forwards each time step like a history. But because, we've, because each of these are kind of a mechanical operation of passing through and multiplying by numbers and adding numbers and then passing it forwards and adding by numbers da, 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 up to the end, at the end you'll have an error and you'll pass it all backwards. You can, well, another word for the, this blame game is backpropagation. Backpropagation of errors is the derivative chain rule. So basically because this whole thing is is simple operations which you can take derivatives of and which things like TensorFlow will make it super easy to, to take derivatives of without even having to think about it. Because it's differentiable, you can train this to do tasks and it will learn those tasks. So here's a picture of the basic RNN. It could be symbolized like this, basically a network feeding on itself or you can think of it as a chain where these inputs lead to a a network here with some hidden state, it passes on to the next, next one. This kind of builds up more and more hidden state inside. So, this, again, each node knows its history, all the weights are tied because this is essentially the same network, and you've got network depth being time wise. So, this is a plain re recurrent neural network. What we have here, this is the same diagram again, but basically you start with a hidden state, which could be just zero. This is the, un, the uninitialized beginning pre-sentence, for instance. Then each word you, you do, each word that comes along, in, however it gets into the network, we do some multiplications, do some adding, it passes on whatever's left over, do the same. Basically you have this mess, which is evolving as each new word comes in, and at the end, you say, give me the answer. And the answer could be, is this a positive sentiment or, or whatever? And if it gets it wrong, you then blame everything for t telling you the wrong information. But what you do is you do this for millions of sentences, millions of different blames, 
and uh, this should learn. But the problem is that this has a gradient problem. So the gradient problem is, in a long sequence, the early inputs are very deep, in as much as the, the very first word, if I said not a good movie, um, the word not is kind of further back, right? Or not a good movie for families with young children. Okay, now, now the not is a good movie for families with good children would be quite a nice sentence to have, not a good movie, would be a very bad sentence to have. So you've got to reach all the way back through, the, through this chain um, with these problems, but each problem in this very simple version is just adding and multiplying and adding and multiplying, adding and multiplying. So if you get any one of those, these parameters wrong, you're adding and multiplying by the same parameter again and again and again and again, if you make a tiny error in that parameter, the, the numbers will explode, right? The parameter's near one, it's gonna be fine, but if it's 0.5, you'll have no error. If you have two, then the error will be exploding. So this is a problem for this thing, and it, typically people wouldn't be able to train very long networks. So the solution to this is instead of always multiplying by a weight, what you want to have is like a straight through path. So I would want to be able to go directly from my error here to the not at the beginning, because that's kind of actually the most important thing. And basically this will give me a gradient one path, it essentially transport my error to the beginning. And what you'd want to do is be able to switch that error signal on and off somehow gating. So this is what a gated recurrent neural network, gated recurrent network looks like, unit looks like. So basically here is, this is one, this, this is now, a whole bunch of matrix multiplies, some of which gate, some of which pass along. Here is my input. This is kind of the hidden state from before. This is a kind of remembering, this is a forgetting, this is an internal state. This is a whole mess of stuff built up to kind of gate this signal on and off. And up here is kind of my straight through path. So you can use this as in TensorFlow or in Keras, this will just be GRU. There'll be a function GRU which would do what you want. So in some sense, this is a difficult diagram. In another sense, you just need to know the words G, R, and U. Here's another one. This is very, very popular, um, invented by Schmidt Huber in uh, Switzerland, um, as you will say. This is also extremely popular. This is a long, long short-term memory unit. Um, basically, here is your input. These is, is your Xs. These, basically up here, are kind of your hidden states, but then going across here, there's all sorts of multiplies and, and non-linearities and stuff. But here, the only difference between this code and that code is the letters LSTM, as far as, say, Keras is concerned. So, okay, this is PhD here, piled higher and deeper. Um, so you can also, you've got these layers, you can pile them higher. So the inputs in the, the hidden stuff in one layer can be the X's of the next layer. Why not? So if you, want, if you think you've got some good features this way, but it could be more uh, hierarchical, then have another layer on top. So we can just build this up that way. Or if you've got context which may affect you backwards, suppose I'm seeking German, where my verb is at the end, and that could inform my, my thoughts at the beginning, I actually want to run information backwards along the line. So as well as having my English text with not a very good movie for families with children, you know, unless they're girls. Okay, so suddenly the girls thing really affects what you, maybe, I don't know. Okay. So the key point, even having done all of this, with all these matrix multipliers and everything, it's all still differentiable, um, which means that you can train these things. And which means that given that natural language processing is a sequence of words or whatever, it's a sequence, we can probably learn to do natural language processing using this machinery. So, text. So that was part one. Part two, text. Text is very intuitive to everyone, and that's kind of one of its AI problems. It's not so obvious what's going on, and I'm going to kind of point out how bad the situation is. So for text, you've got documents, you've got paragraphs, you've got sentences, words, characters, this is obvious. In order to feed this stuff into a neural network of any kind, you've got to pre-process it, or into any kind of data science, you need to pre-process it. So you've got to encode it, 
You've probably got to sentence split it, you've got to tokenize it, you've got to think about your vocabulary and what to do when there's exceptions. For instance, for the encoding, can you even open the file? So this is a, this is a problem. Is your whole pathway Unicode clean? Like what character sets are you going to accept? At some point, are you transmitting it over something which will just basically throw away a lot of your data? Is E the same as E or E, whatever? So here's a French symbol. Um, it can be written in Unicode quite a lot of ways. Uh, the question is, if I have a Fabergé or something, is that the same as a Fabergé egg, right? And so that's a good big question for your dictionary. Um, how flexible should it be? What about this? Uh, this is a Japanese quote symbol. Is it the same as this quote, this double quote? Or is it the same as this double quote? Or is there any difference? Do I care? What about this uh, bullet point? Which is, this is another, this is all HTML, this page. So this is actually very, very simple encoding. Um, it can get very hairy. What about this one, which is a nice one? Which is, one of them is a ligature. Um, it's not obvious what's going on here. So there's a special thing in, in typography called ligatures where the F and the I are actually connected together. So I don't think, it doesn't look as though in this character set they've actually made the distinction. But in a better character set, these two characters are joined together and this is a different symbol from FI. This is a problem in finance because finance is a problem and profit is a problem. Um, there's all sorts of problems across all these domains. Sentence splitting. So it's pretty obvious when a sentence ends because it will have a full stop at the end, right? Except that this sentence has only one full stop. The rest is an abbreviation. You've got a decimal point and like an acronym. So, but there are nice libraries which can do this. NLTK doesn't have many uses, but it can do this quite well. So. Um, tokenization. Basically, you've got a, sent a string of, let's decide we've got a sentence now. I want to break this into pieces. It's a good idea to have just a single standard throughout your code base. Otherwise, you'll be fighting yourself with spaces and commas and stuff. Um, there's a pen tree bank, which is a nice tokenization, often used. But what do you do about Chinese text when there are probably no spaces? Um, what do you do about Japanese, which is a whole different idea about what punctuation symbols to use? Um, another thing which will hit you is lots of this research is very uh, English-centric. Um, so this is one of the reasons why having uh, an NLP-based startup here is a different animal from one based in the valley, just because we actually care about these things already. Um, and here is a, this isn't so easy. Um, in fact, this is tokenized like a pen tree rank. Unt is, uh, it does have a space here because that's the way it should be in a pen tree rank tokenization. Um, anyway. Vocabulary. Okay, so suppose we've converted our sentence to tokens. So what we want to do is we'll build a dictionary and we convert the tokens into numbers. So now we obviously want to be in a numeric domain eventually. And a very simple frequency analysis will, talk, will tell us what are the stop words, which are extremely frequent words which have fairly little semantic value. It could be of, this, the, a. I mean, a lot of what I say will be stop words, but you will only hear stop and words and say. I mean, there's a... Then there's common and normal words, which will be the vast bulk of it. And you can probably get up to like 10, 15,000 words, which will just all be common. And then you move into the domain of pretty rare words. They will be infrequent, will be fairly infrequent. Um, you can imagine all sorts of TensorFlow will be very infrequent, um, just because it's a fairly new word. There will also be typos and junk. In any given text, they'll be junk. Um, and then you want to have a special unknown symbol, which is often called unk. So, understanding text. So now we've got it in some kind of manageable format, basically a string of numbers or a sequence of numbers. English, we probably want to have a vocabulary of about 100,000 words as kind of your minimum sensible size. People go up to like two million, but then you're just grabbling with uh, web addresses and just junk. You've, you've now made the junk, promoted that to being like officially a word. And two simple ways of doing this is bag of words and the word embeddings. So bag of words is you, you convert a sentence 
into a set of words. You basically throw away the ordering of the words because it's irrelevant to you. And you do a kind of simple statistical analysis. This is basically how surprising is every word in this sentence compared to the rest of the documents. This, doing it this way is what people have been doing for the last 30 years. It's surprisingly effective. And many people who would claim to do in natural language processing, AI, are only doing this because it works well enough to fool you until, you've, until you're familiar with it. Um, but because it's got no idea that jumps is a different word from jump. It has no idea that jump is similar to spring. It has no idea that spring is similar to summer. Or spring is similar to winter. And that winter stuff to do with jumpers, right? And jumpers is to do with jumps. So another way to do it is to go for word embeddings. Um, there's a major advanced word to vec glove. These things came out since 2010, maybe 2012. Um, the idea is that words which are close in the text should have representations which are close. Um, but at the beginning, we start off with just numbers. Now we want to convert it into a vector. So each word will have a 300-dimensional vector. And the way in which we generate this is you slide a window over your text. And everything within that window, we then nudge towards each other. So this nudging process is kind of like a backpropagation idea. But the nudging, if you do this enough, and when I say some text, we're talking like a billion words. Um, so if you, Wikipedia would be a good starting place, right? So you do this enough and you do it multiple iterations, these things will converge into something which is surprisingly interesting. Um, so what, what I, I'll actually show a little example where it shows you how these things will self-organize into a very interesting space, whereby things which are similar to each other Will, will, will align, and things which don't have much to do with each, each other will not. So there are also other things which you can do to do with um, ge the geometry of this space, which is even more crazy, um, but doesn't seem particularly valuable at this point. But. Um, so text demo time. Let me go and... Uh, oh, so that's me. Okay, so basically, so all of this... Sorry, the reason that there's a picture of me there... <laughs> apart from it being excellent, is here is my GitHub repo. Okay? And in this GitHub repo, there's a thing called Deep Learning Workshop. Deep Learning Workshop has all of this code. Um, there's these notebooks which you can download. If I've made it so that these, if, if you download this code, you can run it. It will pull in everything it needs. Um, it's all right there. So th there's no secrets here. You can run this on your own if you want to. Or I encourage you to run this at home. Okay. So it also has some comments, which I won't bother reading. Um, basically here, I'm pulling in... If anybody, if anybody, it's a long way away, I'm sorry. But basically, there's a thing called punct from NLTK, which enables you to do sentence splitting. And there's some examples of how it actually does that. Um, this is a thing where it actually shows you how it can tokenize a little sentence. Um, I've also got a corpus of Wikipedia right there. So, so basically, I've got a very small corpus of Wikipedia. It's just the first 100,000 sentences. Um, I think this actually allows you to... This spreadsheet allows you to actually create a glove embedding. Um, but I'm going to skip that, I think, because, because of time. Um, one of the things you'll learn from 100,000 sentences even if you run this glove embedding for lots of iterations, and this takes maybe 30 seconds, it's not, well, no, two minutes, I think, it's not too bad, you'll get a very bad word embedding. A better way of getting a word embedding is just to download one off the shelf. And off the shelf means people have published these, it's a big download, but once you've got it, you've got a nice word embedding. Um, so I may have to actually run some stuff. Nah. <coughs> Just stop me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I do want to do that. Word embedding is poor.
this doing anything? Sorry, excuse me. Okay, so basically I've downloaded a word embedding. So this, I've just taken the first 100,000 words of a glove embedding, which is a 50-dimensional embedding. So this is actually a fairly small embedding. Um, and I can ask, there's a simple, form, simple call I can do, what is the most similar words to king? And it's telling me prince and queen and I, I, whatever that is an emperor. So it sees that emperor and these things appear in the same context all the time. Equally, I can then test analogies. So this, this is the geometry. So this immediately shows you that man is to woman as king is to queen, daughter, prince and throne. Queen is the first selection. It likes that. So this, is, this word embedding has actually captured a huge amount of not just of similarity within the language, it's actually captured something about relationships. The next one is Paris is to France as Rome is to Italy. So it's actually co captured geography from just reading Wikipedia and, and doing a simple nudging kind of thing across a window. Kitten is to cat as Pappy is to dog, so that's another thing about animals, relationships. And understand is to understood as run is to ran. So this is actually picking up some kind of crazy grammatical thing just by reading, um, just by reading and reading, and that's it. So what what I can do, if I'm, let me just check I'm running it. What I can do here is I can pick up that. there is a nice thing called TensorBoard. So TensorBoard is part of TensorFlow. Basically, it'll let you graph out your, your data, but it'll also let you graph out your embeddings. So this is the word embedding cloud formed by, which I've just loaded in, and I can look around in this cloud. It's kind of difficult to see what's going on. But if I type in, say, king, and there we go, and let's just show those points. So here's a, here's a tensor. Here's where all the kingish words are. So you've got queen over here, father, imperial. So this is kind of interesting that it actually can get this out of pure data. It doesn't actually know anything about the English language um, apart from where to split a sentence or whatever. It can do this by reading Wikipedia. So you're getting all this stuff for free. So let's kill that. And I might actually kill this too. Okay. So, ba ba ba. Okay. So, that was a text demo. So, what we've understood so far is, and you can prove it to yourselves, you can tokenize stuff, um, we can convert it to word embeddings, which is strongly the better way to do it than TIDF now. So, um, so now we've got, basically, each of my words corresponds to a 100-dimensional or a 50-dimensional sequence of numbers. So I can just take that as one word, then I have another word, and then another word, and another word, and I can run a network of some kind across these numbers, and I'm entirely in a matrix multiply kind of domain. So let's try an application of this. The application here is recurrent neural networks for text. If you're trying to build a quality natural language processing system, like I have been for these kind of people over here, um, an essential component of this is named entity recognition, which is I will call NER, just for, uh, for elegance. And this has to be flexible and trainable, partly because we're in, in a region where there's lots of new stuff coming. Um, we need to train it specifically differently from the guys in the US do. Particularly, there are quirks here. So, for instance, in, in NER terms, in Singapore it may be fairly rational, um, but in Malaysia you've got the datos are all something, something, something. That's one whole thing. Chinese names can be rearranged in strange ways. And this is just for people. 
On the other hand, one thing which the American systems will be robust against is that Richard can be called Rick or Ricky or Dick, or Charles can be called Charlie or Chuck or Chaz. And that, anyway, that there's a whole bunch of different things which the Westerners do which aren't necessarily done here. Um, but on the other hand, systems in papers typically are orientated, on co and corpuses are orientated to the, the kind of Western case. So here's a quick example of what Nur is. Um, we want to transform, soon after his graduation, Jim Soon became managing director of Lam Soon. So you can see the, the problem here, right? We want to know that Jim Soon is a person, and Lam Soon is an organization. And the, the, the key kind of things which we're watching for is his graduation kind of means there's probably a person coming up. Because the word became is something which well, it's more of a person thing than, well, maybe it's more of a person thing than corporate thing. But managing director of is almost always followed by um, Lamsun. Now, I may be managing director of my daughter, but apart from that, managing director is a company. So, so there's kind of sign, but you can see that there's signposts in here which you could get just from the data. By the li if I aligned every sentence in a huge corpus with managing director of something, all of them would agree that the next thing was probably an organisation. Except it could be managing director of a company he founded, which, OK, then you'd have to get that a pass, right? So the question is, can we train a, an, a, an RNN of some... RNN is kind of a generic term. Can we train an RNN to do NER? So what we want to do is we'll create, or probably just download a word embedding. We'll get a NER annotated training set, so either it will be human annotated, so someone's actually gone through and said, okay, this is a person thing, this is a organization thing, or location, or a date, or whatever. Or we create it in some way by labeling, which is the basis of a paper, for instance. And then we just train an RNN on this data set and then see whether we get any decent results. So for this is going to be a demo. So the human annotated corpuses or corpora are difficult for me to distribute. So I do this workshop thing where I hand out USB keys, but I can't do that with any official corpus because these are expensive and difficult to license. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of cheat here. I've got some Wikipedia, 100,000 lines of that, and I'm going to use NLTK to annotate it as if NLTK was the truth, which it isn't, but I'll try. Right? And then I'm going to train the RNN on the machine annotations, and I'm going to just look at how well it performs compared to its trainer, which is NLTK. So this seems like a fairly fair baseline. But in order to make it more interesting, I'm only going to let the RNN look at text in single case. So I'm going to transform all the text into uppercase or lowercase. Um, but the trick in that is, I, if it works, it will be great, because I know that NLTK will totally fail if it's all lowercase, because NLTK really relies heavily on is whether the words are uppercase or not. So here's a quick network picture, but this is something we can all understand now. I'm going to use a bidirectional GRU, recurrent neural network. Here are my Xs, but each X is going to be a vector from my embedding. It will go up into two different networks, and then they'll be combined to which this thing will be a label at the top. Is this a NER or not? And going this way is basically the hidden state in a forwards direction. And this one is going for in a backwards direction. So this kind of lets me, if I know I'm starting a name, I'll, I can get to the end. But if I know I found the end of a name, I can get back to the start. It's, basically, it's good, it's good to have two ways. Right? So this is another, there's another thing in the, the notebook. Uh, another notebook in the work, workshop, um, which lets you do this. Um, and I know I'm running low on time, so... Da -da. And basically, this is something... Oh, I've almost, almost got time. So basically, this is a, a tagger. And I, I'm just going to pull in the same tools which I had before. I'll pull in the corpus like I had before. And the reference tagger, which is the NLTK thing. So this can do a, this can do some job of actually annotating parts of speech. This is let's see what part of speech analysis on this simplex looks like. Okay. So this is identifies where the nouns are. Um, it does a, quite a good job of actual part of speech thing. 
But I'm actually going to make this all lowercase, and I'm just going to learn where the nouns are, basically. I'll load in some glove, and I'll fix it up so that the word embedding is Keras compatible. Because Keras, which is what I'm going to be using here, is a layer on top of TensorFlow, which means that instead of specifying every little matrix multiplication I'm going to do, I can just say grew, or I can say bidirectional, and it will do just the right thing to construct the whole TensorFlow graph. So I think you're going to find that a lot of more of our stuff becomes Keras focused um, because it just makes things easier. And if you're starting out, Keras is probably the way to go. So this, this is fixing up. This would be like a Keras thing. Da, da, da. Um, so, sorry. so here is kind of the magic. Let me just. Uh, okay. So basically, this page is taking the tokens input at the top, which is my sentence length of stuff, and then it's make, converting this using an embedding into a sequence of embeddings, and then it's doing a bidirectional GRU. And then it's going to concatenate them. And at the end of it, it's going to do some kind of dense thing with a softmax. So this defines the entire deep learning experience here. But you've seen how much extra stuff we've had to do because this is text, because this is text is quite tricky. Um, and Keras will helpfully give us here is um, how many parameters are involved. We've got. Uh, We've got 5 million parameters in the embedding. Um, the model will only take 30,000 parameters. So this is actually kind of a small model. Um, da, da, da. And now we're going to do the training of the model. So this is another feature of the workshop, is that these things should train in five minutes or less. So I will now dance. Um, <laughs> this is, so this is going to do 1,000 epochs. Um, each epoch is, I think, 64 sentences. So this will then read 64,000 sentences and run them through this. So we're now at 150 of 1,000, and it's going to finish in... So this is a nice feature of Keras in that instead of running big training loops and having all this kind of crazy stuff, basically there's a nice progress bar. And this is very nice, and it, also, it will also enable you to do... Graphs out for TensorBoard. It has some very nice features. So we're just going to let this in. We're at 300 now. So this is being trained on my laptop. My laptop's got a, an i5 CPU. It's got 8 gig of memory. It's not, a, it's not like a super duper laptop. Um, it does have an internal graphics. It has a GPU graphics card. But basically it's switched off because GPUs are like special petals, you know. Um, it, when you update your machine, everything stops working. So if you've got a desktop, maybe it's worth it, or a server, worth it. This laptop, I'm not going to touch the GPU. It does work, but uh, makes it makes life very different. Uh, question. Just. So is there a way to, uh, to actually uh, put the server point? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so you, what you can do is, in, in here, you can add something called callbacks, and you can pass it an array of callbacks, and at the end of every epoch, it will do your callbacks. And one of the callbacks is like keras.early stopping. So you can add in early stopping criteria, you can add in different things to look at how you're doing, basically, or, or save my state, or, or whatever. So, right, right, right. So, so you, can, you can do all of that kind of game. But also, there's in, in part of this, there's also um, basically uh, you can define what loss functions you are, what optimization functions you are. So you may have something which also flags up whether it's going backwards on itself, kind of thing. There's there's a whole bunch of variability. Another nice thing about Keras is all of the um, all of the defaults are good. Basically, they've read all the papers. If you just put in the standard stuff, it's probably about middle of the road. Whereas in TensorFlow Raw, 
you may forget a parameter and it's, you're actually way out of left field and everyone's decided that dropout should be a half or something. So. Anyway, we're now at epoch 1000. Uh, we don't have to save these weights, don't have to load them. Um, I've got a little function. And here we have some output. So I've got... It's very difficult to see, I'm sorry. But this is it's fighting me. So I've got some sample sentences here. And the first one is, well, three sets. But if you look at them, they're slightly different. So the first one is a pure sentence, which is, Dr. Andrews works at Red Cat Labs. Then let's see what part of speech analysis looks like. When are you off to New York? Chitanya. Okay. One interesting thing about Indian names is they're kind of all unique. But anyway. So what this is showing here, on each word, basically this is what NLTK says. So NLTK thinks that Dr. Andrews is a NER, and this RNN thinks that Dr. Andrews is a NER. And it also thinks that Red Cat Labs is a NER. So both of them agree here, which is good. Um, NLTK thinks that New York is a NER, which is right. Um, I just think that York is a NER, so that's not quite right. Um, Chitanya, they both pick up. So, so this is, you can see that basically one has learned from the other. Um, you wouldn't expect the RNN to be better than the LST, the better than the NLTK one, because it's its teacher, its only teacher has been that. But if you now go for this one, where it's using proper case, which is every, every word starts with a capital letter. Dr. Andrews works, okay, so it thinks that the first name is Dr. Andrews works, um, record lapse is fine, let's see what part is it. So it thinks that speech analysis is, is a name, um, so this is NLTK. So NLTK is for all of these problems, whereas, in fact, the RNN, because it, it did all its learning on the lowercase version, it sees no difference between these sentences. So, provably, it learnt to be almost as good as its teacher, but it's actually superior in many, many ways, in that you can apply this to text which the teacher totally fails on. So, yeah. I mean, so there is a kind of section, let's look at the statistics, but it's hardly worth it because um, it's, the teacher's just so much, the, the output is so much better. So here's my wrap up. Um, text processing is messy. Uh, word embeddings are magic. Um, RNNs can be applied to lots of things. Text is what we're focusing on now. And having a GPU is very helpful because I just did this on 64,000 sentences but our typical training run would be 100, 100 million sentences, um, which is kind of like an eight hour job, an overnight job on a GPU. Um, there's also, you've seen the workshop thing. If you like it, please add a star. I like that, um, that's my KPI. I will take questions, but before that, I'll ask you questions. There's a feedback form that Google would love us to fill in, and it's at bit.ly, TF minus SG, TF dash SG. If you fill it in before the end, there will be prizes. If you fill it in after the end, you no prize for you. So there we go. And I will take questions. Um, um, I will not accept friend requests, but I will accept LinkedIn. So OK, Karthik, do you want to? So I'll stand here. He'll do the, he'll do the next.